Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and it is a uh, pleasure to, uh, to be with you this afternoon and really talk about how you as a brand can profit from experience. I'd like to start off actually with one particular brand that, that, that truly revolutionized its industry, that um, uh, completely wiped away its, its competition and set off an innovation war in its industry because of one particular experience innovation that it came up with. Let, let me know if you've ever seen this particular uh, innovation before. Right, have you seen these devices? Uh, I've seen them around the world. You know, and it, what happens here, if you haven't seen one, is a kid will come up to, uh, to the, this device called the gumball wizard, that's what it's called, and put his coin in the slot and then turn the crank and then not get a gumball, at least not right away. Instead, he gets this gumballing experience as it goes spiraling down, clickety-clack as it goes. Now, there's no functional purpose whatsoever for this device. You don't get a better manufacturer's good. The, the, the gumball's the same as it's always been. You don't get better service. In fact, you could say the service is actually worse. Why? Right, it takes longer to get the gumball that you requested, and yet it has more value. Right? It has more value because of that gumballing experience. And now I've seen gumball machines that are like kinetic sculptures with the gumball moving this way and that way, parachuting and trampoline around. Uh, there are some that are like pinball machines where you shoot that gumball up and now you're batting it back and forth. You want, to see, you want it to take as long as possible before it drains down the middle and you finally retrieve your gumball. I've seen kids go up to their parents, ask them for a coin, take that coin up to the slot, put it in the slot, turn the crank, excitedly have that gumball experience, then pick up the gumball, throw it away, and go ask their parents for another coin. It's really just a slot machine for kids is what it is. But why do we see innovations like this? Why is this going on? Well, it's basically because of very fundamental change in the very fabric of the economy. You know, we used to have an agrarian economy based off commodities, where you extract commodities out of the ground and sell them on the, the open market. Then, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, and particularly to the system of mass production, which was created by Henry Ford 100 years ago this month, put it all, all together, uh, we shifted into an industrial economy based off goods. We use commodities as the raw material to make or manufacture physical things. Right? That's what goods are, the physical things that we touch and feel. Then in the latter half of the 20th century, we shifted into a service economy, where now we, we, companies predominantly delivered services, which are individual activities done on behalf of an individual person. And what happened in the service economy is that goods became commoditized. Commoditized, I mean they're treated like a commodity, where people didn't care uh, uh, who makes them, they don't care about the brand, they don't care about the features, they're all pretty much the same anyway. They come to care about three things, and three things only, and that's price, price, and price. And that's what happens when goods have been commoditized. And in fact, the internet is the greatest force of commoditization ever invented. The frictionless marketplace means that customers can instantly compare prices from one vendor to another, and it tends to push them down to the lowest possible price. But what we see increasingly is that services are being commoditized as well. Long distance cell phone service today is sold on price, price, price. Fast food restaurants with all their value pricing, and the internet can even commoditize services. If you look at financial services in the U.S., what used to cost several hundred U.S. dollars to buy or sell a block of shares with a full-service broker can today cost as low as $3 with an Internet-based broker. And what that means is that goods and services are everywhere becoming mere commodities. Goods and services are no longer enough. To create economic value today, companies have to move to a new level of value to go beyond the goods and services to staging experiences for their customers. Now, the most important thing to understand about this framework, so if you, if you remember nothing else from the time you're spending here this afternoon than this, rem remember this, that experiences are a distinct economic offering, as distinct from services as services are from goods. So we're shifting today into an experience economy, where experiences are the predominant economic offering, where experiences is where growth is going to come in GDP and employment. Experiences is where consumers want to spend their time, their hard-earned time, and the, and the hard-earned money on, and even in business-to-business -business situations. You see increasingly that companies are staging experiences for their customers. And that's what's required. So therefore, we need to create experience innovations and thereby profit from the experience. Now, I remember a trip to uh, Europe a, a number of years ago. It was about a decade ago. I was in Milan. And I was giving a boardroom presentation to a number of different executives, and one of them was from Maxwell House here in Europe. And he said something that floored me. He said, you know, there's been no innovation in the coffee industry in 15 years. And I said, have you never heard of Starbucks? 
Because for him, innovation was in goods. Right? He had blinders on. All they thought about, we're a goods manufacturer, we innovate in goods, and totally missed the innovation in the coffee-drinking experience that Starbucks created. The irony, of course, being it was Milan itself that inspired Howard Schultz to come back to the U.S. and create a different kind of coffee-drinking experience that therefore had not been known before in the U.S. and now increasingly uh, 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 exported around the world. Now, if you think about coffee, it actually perfectly exemplifies this progression that I'm talking about. Because coffee at its core is what? Right, it's a commodity. It's beans, right? You know it's a commodity. You can actually look up the future price of coffee in the Financial Times every morning. Right, anything that has a future price, that's a commodity. And if you look at that future price and you convert it from a per ton to a per cup basis, you know how much coffee costs per cup when you treat it as a commodity? One or two pence. That's all a cup of coffee. That's all the beans are worth that are in a cup of coffee. But if you take those same beans and now you roast them, you grind them, you put them on a grocery store shelf like Maxwell House does, now you get five or ten cents per cup of coffee for that. If you perform the service of actually brewing it for a customer in a vending machine, in a kiosk, a, a bodega somewhere, now you can get 50 pence to a pound, pound and a half per cup of coffee. But surround the brewing of that coffee with the ambiance and theater of a Starbucks, and now how much are you pay? Right? Two, three, maybe even four pounds per cup of coffee with only two or three pence worth of, of beans in it. Right? One industry with four distinct levels of value, simply depending on what business does the company think it's in. Right? What business does it think it's in? So what business do you think you're really in? Right now, Starbucks actually doesn't hold the record for a cup of coffee. I had the opportunity a few years ago to take my wife to Venice. And of course, we went to the Piazza San Marco and, and, and ordered a cup of coffee at the Cafe Florian. And we spent over an hour in that, that, that most old world of Italian cities. You know, and, and then I got the bill. You know how much a plain old cup of coffee costs at the Cafe Florian? 13 and a half euros. Right? 13 and a half euros. Was it worth it? Assolutamente. Right, absolutely. If you create a great experience, your customers are going to be willing to pay you for that experience. Now, contrast what Maxwell House did with what Nestle did right, after Starbucks innovated this coffee drinking experience. Right, Nestle created and innovated this wonderful Nespresso machine where the using of the product itself is an experience. And that's one of the things all manufacturers now need to pay attention to, is how do we make the using of our product be an experience, right? That can be an experience that you create for consumers when they use it over and over and over again, right? And thanks to the pod system where you can select your own particular variety that goes into that Nespresso machine and make that individual cup at home or in the office just for you. They then created this wonderful store environment, the Nespresso Boutique, where you can now uh, buy the machine, buy more pods of coffee, and even experience that cup of coffee inside of the boutique right there. Online, you can join the Nespresso Club, have your particular individual assortment delivered to your home so that you never run out of them. Right? Turning again just a plain old manufactured good of the coffee right, into an engaging experience through the entire journey that each customer has with Nespresso. And of course, it doesn't hurt if George Clooney is your spokesperson. Right now, I actually don't drink coffee, right? Never touch the stuff, but I'm a tea drinker, right? I should have been born here, right? I, I love tea. And this is my standard order at Starbucks. I've already had, I've been here for two days, I've had three of these so far, all right? And it's a Vente non-fat six pump, no water chai extra hot. Right? And every one of those things that I designate is a particular way of customizing that chai just for me. And that's actually how I discovered this experience economy. It's from my first book that I wrote 20 years ago now called Mass Customization. And I recognize that if you customize a good, you automatically turn it into a service. If you look at the classic economic distinctions between them, you know, goods are standardized, services are customized. They're done just for an individual person. Goods are inventoried after demand, but services are delivered when the customer says this is exactly what they want, done on demand. And uh, uh, goods are tangible and services intangible, but part and parcel of mass customization is the intangible service of helping customers figure out what is it they want. So if you mass customize your goods, you design exactly the right goods for this particular person, helping them define what they want, then make and then deliver it to them individually, then you're really in the service business. And in the same way, customizing a service automatically turns it into an experience. 
If you design a service that is so appropriate to this particular person, exactly the service that they need at this moment in time, you can't help but make them go wow and turn it into a memorable event. So customization really is the route up this progression of economic value, where commoditization is like the law of gravity that just you know, brings you down year after year. Customization allows you to differentiate yourself and create more economic value for your customers. So it's why you see brands like Coca-Cola getting into the freestyle machine, where you can now go up to these and they have hundreds of different choices you can make. You can choose to have 30% you know, Coke and 70% Diet Coke. Add in a, a spritz of lemon or lime if you want, and basically create your own drink right there at the fountain. You see brands like Adidas coming out with My Adidas, you know, first with professional athletes and now with everybody to define a pair of shoes that will help you, you know, be the best athlete that, that you can be and do what otherwise would be impossible to you. Now, what you see the world over is recognize this, that, that as a brand in today's experience economy, you are competing against the world. You're competing against the world. You may think your competitors are those in your other industry. No. You may think only in the geographic area in which you reside. No. You're competing against the world for the time, attention, and money of individual customers. Right? These are the currencies of today's experience economy. And time is limited. We can only experience things 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, we've got to fit sleep in there sometime. And if somebody is, if I'm spending my time with some other brand, what am I not doing? I'm not spending that time with you. Right? Exactly, I'm not spending it with you. In the same way, attention is scarce. In today's media fragmented world, it's increasingly hard to capture somebody's attention with advertising. Right? But if somebody does capture my attention and I'm giving it to them, what am I not doing? Right? I'm not giving it to you. In the same way, money is consumable. If I've got a pound to spend and I spend it with a different company in a different industry in a different geographic area, it doesn't matter, that pound is gone. Right? I can't spend it again. It's consumed. So you're competing against the world for time, attention, and money. So it's important to understand a very basic principle of the experience economy, which is that the experience is the marketing. And the experience is the marketing. The best way to generate demand today for any offering, whether it's a commodity, a good, a service, or even another experience, is with an experience so engaging that customers can't help but pay attention, spend their time with you, and then give you their money as a result by buying your particular offering. So what you want to do is you want to start staging marketing experiences, right? Not just experience marketing, which, which includes, well, let's just evoke the senses in our, in our, in our website. Let's, let's have dimensional mailers and that sort of thing. No, create actual experiences, whether physical or virtual, actual experiences where people can experience your products, right? your, what, what your offerings, whatever they might be, right? that, and then do the job of marketing, <coughs> which is generate demand. Right? That's what marketing's job is, to generate demand, and experiences are the best way of generating demand. So that's why you see companies like Steinway & Sons. Is there somebody from Steinway here? I think they're oh, very good, right? I don't know if you do this over here in the UK, but in the US, you buy a grand piano from Steinway. It may cost thirty dollars to $90,000. And you'll get a phone call, and they'll offer to throw a concert in your home. And they invite, they, they, they actually invite out friends and neighbors that you'd like to come over for the concert. The night of the concert have valet parking outside, they serve wine and hors d'oeuvres inside, and then they hire a professional concert pianist to play your own piano in your own home. And you know that's the best that piano is ever going to sound, is the night of that concert. <laughs> and, and the gentleman told me about this, said Steinway did a wonderful job, the pianist was magnificent, and after the concert, two of his friends bought pianos for their homes. And that's what I mean by the experience is the marketing. They saw what it would be like to have a piano in their home. They say, oh, we want that same experience in our own home as well. It works for $90,000 pieces of art, really. It also works for incredibly low involvement products, like toilet paper. Right? This is the Charmin restroom experience that Procter & Gamble has put inside of Times Square uh, for six years in a row. And they, they, what happens here is you go through the doors below this restroom sign there. And restrooms are not the easiest thing to find in New York City. It's one of the reasons why this experience works. And you go up these escalators where they have brand ambassadors, they call them, that are singing the praises of Charmin. And I mean literally singing the praises of Charmin. You get up to the top, you get into this queue to be able to use a restroom in there. They have 20 different restrooms, and they call it the ultimate restroom experience because they clean them after every use. There's a door in front, there's also a door in back. 
so that make sure there are never any issues when you walk into this restroom. You know, as you do walk in there, you have your choice from their toilet paper menu, right? Six different varieties that you can try out during your experience. Uh, when you get done, you can get your picture taken on the world's largest toilet. You can uh, sing and dance with the Charmin Bear mascot if you want. And the, uh, the first year they did this, they exposed, if you pardon the expression, over 400,000 people to Charmin toilet paper. They got over 450 million media impressions around the world, including the front page of the New York Times. The New York Times three times in six weeks. And sales of Charmin went up 14%. Right? 14% because of this experience. And I, I always like to say, if you can do it with toilet paper, <laughs> right, you can do it with anything. Right? So here's the Apple store that Paul was talking about. Right? This wonderful glass cube on Fifth Avenue with the subterranean store. Somebody once described it to me as like descending into the mind of Steve Jobs as you walk inside of there. And you may remember when they started these stores 11 years ago, they actually got lambasted in the business press. People said, what are you doing getting into retail? You're a designer. You're a manufacturer. You don't know anything about retail. You're going to have channel conflict. You're going to have all these issues. You're going to blow it. You're going to ruin the brand. And instead, what do they do? They created the number one retail store in the world. Right? The, the Apple stores, they have over 400 now, I think it is, and they get over 6,000 US dollars per square foot. That's over an order of magnitude more than the average retailer. Number two is Tiffany's. It gets about $3,000 per square foot, right? So double the average retailer. Now, yes, it's predicated on great products, right? A great experience is not going to help you recover from great products, right? What's that old saw in advertising that, that, that great advertising just helped bad products fail faster? Well, that's even going to be more so true with, with, with experiences. But if you have great products and then you combine that, with a great experience to expose those products to your potential customers, right? then you've got a winning combination. And that's what Apple demonstrates. And you see more and more brands that get into this. Right? Bulgari, right? making a personal body care products. They've opened up a number of hotels. I happened to stay at that trip in Milan. I stayed at the Bulgari Hotel in Milan. Again, allowing people to, to get at the very essence of the brand and how they design this particular hotel, as well, of course, use Bulgari's products in their room in there. The Guinness Storehouse in, in Dublin, right, actually designed by imagination to be a wonderful admission feed experience that you go into that has now become the number one tourist attraction in all of Dublin, right, getting around a million visitors per year. And out of those a million visitors per year, about 125,000 of them, thousand of them become Guinness drinkers as a result of their experience here, generating demand. Generating, in fact, about 20 million pints every year of new demand because of the storehouse for which they charge admission, right? getting money for that. Right? That's how to create a great experience. And you can do it in old, dusty industries and that. It's not just new companies that come and create, right? Guinness has been around for hundreds of years. ING in the Netherlands has been around for hundreds of years. And when they came over to the US marketplace, they realized that banking had become commoditized. In fact, I don't think any industry is as commoditized as banking because it came to view spending time with customers as costing them money. They didn't want to spend time with customers, so customers didn't want to spend time with them. So, so recognizing that, what they did in the U.S. is they created the ING Direct Cafes. These are real, live, working cafes. Right, this is the first one that they installed on 49th Street in Manhattan, where you go up to the counter, you order a cup of coffee, maybe a biscotti, you pay for it. But then as you walk around, you realize this is a different sort of cafe because there's, there's a financial you know, CNBC on the, on the TV. There's newspapers of the Wall Street Journal and Barron's there. That, there are little brochures about savings accounts and stuff. And then your, your barista, your financial barista, who gets uh, 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 two months of training on financial products and then two days of training on how to make coffee, engages you in conversation and tries to get you to move your savings account over into ING accounts or refinance your mortgage with ING funds. And amazingly, it works. The first year this one cafe was opened up resulted in over $200 million in new accounts for ING. Right? A normal bank branch opens up, they hope to get to 30 to $50 million in five years. Right, $200 million its first year. Opened up a second cafe in Philadelphia, $200 million its first year. Third cafe in LA, same thing. Now that they've been open a number of years, they're only generating 50 to $70 million per year, I think, because the regulars have all, all, all given all their money. Right, but creating a wonderful marketing experience that gets people to actually spend time with the brand. You see that also in business to business, not just consumers. Right, so Whirlpool has created the world of Whirlpool on the Chicago River here. 
And what they did is they disbanded their entire trade show budget. So we're not going to go to trade shows where at most we may get 10 to 15 minutes of a customer time. We're going to invite them personally, fly them into Chicago to come into the world of Whirlpool where we can engage them in conversation for hours and sometimes a day or two. And we can actually expose them to our products and let them use those products in there to the best of their abilities, which then will help our dealers and our distributors then sell those products to end consumers. My favorite example of a business-to-business -business marketing experience is actually case construction which created in uh, the Northwoods of Wisconsin in the U.S. the case construction experience. And basically, it's this uh, you know, lodge with a giant sandbox where they bring up their customers. They get to play with the equipment. They have rodeos and contests, you know, who can move the most amount of dirt in the shortest amount of time. And they did a study one time. They said that a normal customer goes up to a dealer. They have perhaps a 20% chance of getting the business. They cut into the Case Tomahawk Experience Center. It goes up to 80% from 20% to 80% because, again, the experience is the marketing. So one of the things I tell people is, you know, compare experiences to advertising. And for the most part, if you do this right, you should really stop all advertising because you can better spend your money on experiences. Now, why is that? Well, look at how you measure the efficacy of advertising, right? What is it? Well, how many people did you reach times your recall rate divided by the cost? i will tell you how effective you are. But look what you're doing with experiences, right? Now, the, the, the number of people that you reach, yes, is generally less, right? You, you can, and in fact, you know, stop all advertising is a bit of an exaggeration. If you still need to reach a lot of people, you've got a new product, you've got a new brand positioning, you've got a, going into a new geographic area, yes, it makes sense to advertise. But in every other situation, for those people you do reach, look at how much time they spend with you. How much time do you spend with an ad? Right? What's the unit of measure? Seconds. So how much time are you spend in these experiences that I'm talking about? Minutes, sometimes hours, potentially even days. You're getting your customers to spend time with you. And then look at how much attention they're giving you. An advertisement has come on the TV and I pay no attention for it either. So I you know, go to the kitchen and make a sandwich. Or I'm reading a newspaper or a magazine and I just bypass that page, which the ad is. You have no idea if they're actually paying attention to you. But you create an experience in which you immerse your customers, then you've got their undivided attention for that period of time. And think about the intensity of that experience, therefore, versus any ad that you can possibly create. Right, you're creating this wonderful, intense experience inside of them, and therefore the memorability of that is going to go way up. Right? They remember experiences far longer, far more intensely than they will measure advertising. So if you divide all of that by cost, right, then just any back of the envelope calculation will tell you this is a better place to put your marketing dollars. It will do a better job of, of generating demand. But that's not the only factor either. Right? There's another factor as well, which is think about all these experiences I've talked about that are actually charging admission for the experience, that are actually getting their customers to pay for the experience. Right? And that's a key factor as well, and that can actually turn marketing from a cost center into a profit center. When you create an experience worth having, customers will pay you for that. Right? They'll gladly pay for the experiences that are worth having. And if you charge an admission fee or in some way charge your customers for it, then you've got the wherewithal to be able to create a great experience. So in addition to the ones I've talked about, you know, my favorite retail experience actually in all of Europe is PGC Hyenas in Amsterdam. I don't know if you know it, but it's a cigar store. And if you love cigars like I love cigars, right, this is the best experience in the world. And I won't talk about all the experience that they have given the time we have, but twice a week, what do they have is that they, in the side of this room there, they have a 35 euro cigar smoking experience, right? An educational experience where they teach you about cigars, the difference between long fillers and short fillers, how to cut a cigar, how to light a cigar, how to let it go out, how to relight a cigar. As part of your experience, they give you a cigar right, for that experience. You often have, have fathers bring their sons in for their first cigar experience inside of the store. And again, charging 35 euros twice a week uh, for that experience, charging admission for it. Or look at Lego, another European manufacturer that's actually been in the experience business for over 40 years when they opened up Legoland in Beeland, Denmark at their headquarters. But now what have they done? They've created an entire portfolio of experiences. They have hundreds of experiences around the world, from the various different Legoland theme parks to Legoland Imagination Centers and Discovery Centers to the Lego design stores that they have created to all these virtual experiences that they create online as well. Right? All of them are, is creating demand for the core product, many of them so much so that they're able to charge admission for that experience that they have. 
Or I remember one of the first times I came to London, I was staying at uh, Radisson at Leicester Square, and I asked, uh, you know, what experiences should I have here? And he said, well, have you ever been to Vinopolis? And I said, no, what's Vinopolis? He said, well, basically it's a wine store, but they charge admission. Oh, well, then I gotta go, right? So I get there and I discover, well, it's not really a wine store, it's really this museum. They charge a 10 pound admission fee, but with that, you get, uh, you get five coupons for wine tasting. Right? And that's one of the ways to do this. Give them something of value back for the admission fee that you're charging. And you go in there and you learn about how grapes are grown, all the different varieties, all the places around the world, uh, how it's turned into wine. You get to try various different wines as part of your experience. And then I remember at the end, they had this huge wine tasting hall. If you haven't uh, you know, used all of your coupons, you can actually purchase more if you want. And then, of course, they dump you into what? All right, the gift shop, right? Except this wasn't any ordinary gift shop, right? You got this cavernous wine store that you can go in and buy any of the varieties that you tasted, which then they'll ship throughout Europe. You know, so I went there thinking it was a wine store that charged a mission. I discovered it was a museum. No, I really think it is a wine store, right? Put a museum out front. We're going to get people to come in, and we're going to sell this wine, and we're going to create an experience worth charging for and therefore turn it into a profit center. And oh, by the way, we'll sell tons of wine as well. Right? That's the key to thinking. So look at ROI now. Right, you measure return on an advertising investment. Right? Normal ROI, how much incremental revenue did we get divided by the cost? Right? That's a good campaign, more revenue, great. Right? But now look at that with experiences. And think about how ROI changes when from that cost you can subtract the admission fees that you charge your customers. And that dramatically improves the ROI. And if you get to the point where you can actually charge your customers right, more than it costs you, as ING Direct Cafe does, not technically a mission fee, but charging for the coffee actually covers the cost of the place. The Guinness Storehouse covering the cost of it, Legoland theme parks, most all of these experiences I'm talking about, the, what you charge for the marketing experience covers the cost so the denominator goes to zero and you effectively get infinite ROI. Right, infinite ROI. I'm not making that up. Right, there's companies that are doing that today because they've created experiences worth having. There's one experience that does that as well as the Land Rover experience. I won't talk about it because you've got a, a, a personal view uh, today on that, but it's another great experience that actually, as a marketing experience, can become a profit center. So let me close by saying that uh, you can stay in the illusory safety of past practices and keep on doing the same thing you've always been doing, in which case, mark my words, you'll become a commodity. Or you can shift up this progression of economic value to staging marketing experiences for each one of your individual customers, in which case, you'll be economically rewarded. Thank you.